go into this. Okay, so we're looking at this whole concept of Mashiach. So somebody told me last week, like they got all heebie-jeebied and they were all nervous from this whole idea of the milchama of Gog, Gog, and all these things that we're talking about that will happen before Mashiach comes. So I just want to look at different perspectives. And they actually say that the most held perspective when it comes to the concept of Mashiach and Olam Haba and Trias Amesim is actually the Rambam. So we say like there's the 13 principles of faith. He wrote a lot and he also wrote something called the Mishnah Torah, which is really a book. It's interesting. It's on Halacha. It's on Halacha, but he wrote two chapters of it just dedicated to the concept of Mashiach just dedicated to Mashiach. So a lot of people will use a lot of what he has to say. Like we, they kind of look at him as the primary source of you know, all these ideas. So what we're going to look here is um, what I want to do is define terms. So we just want to define these terms because we use them and there are different ways of looking at them. And I want to look at them from the way that the Rambam would look at them, okay? So if you looked at the Rambam, here are the three words that we're going to try to define, okay? So one is Olam Haba, the other one is Yemos HaMashiach, which means the days of Mashiach, and the third one is the concept of Trias HaMesim, right? the resurrection of the dead. So he looks at Olam Haba, not as like the end of history, like he has a very different, Look, so let's just like stick to what he has to say and then we'll compare it later. So his version of Olam Haba is what we call also Olam Hanishamos, which is where you go when you die. It's everything that we're learning about on Sunday. That's what he calls Olam Haba. And he says like Olam Haba is where you're going to be totally connected to Hashem. You're not going to be hindered by a body. You can't do um, things. You can't do any more mitzvahs. That, that's all over. The only thing that they say you can do is, remember what we learned on Sunday that I really felt great about? It said like the Torah that you learned here, Hashem is going to give you like complete clarity in this olam haba. You know, even if you couldn't remember things, Hashem is going to help you remember the Torah that you learned. In other words, why? Because the ultimate connection to Hashem is Torah, because Torah is Hashem's diary. So that's about the only thing that you will have. You won't be frustrated. You will have no body. You're not going to have any feelings of the body. It's just like the spiritual life, right? The spiritual bliss that the neshama can enjoy. All right. So then he does talk about the concept of Gehenim. We, we've talked about that. So we called Gehenim. What do we call Gehenim? Like what's a, like we said, it's like a rehab center, right? It's a thera therapeutic, spiritual therapeutic process to get your neshama in line. So if anybody here ever had an accident, anybody fall, break a leg, break an arm, <laughs> lots of fun things. Has anybody done that? Sprained an ankle? Yes. Okay, Barb. So did you go to show for it? Yeah. So when you went to physio, right, like oh, unmute for a second, like the beginning of doing the physio, how does it feel? It hurts. Yes, excellent. Okay, so that's exactly what they say Gehenim is like. It's like you, you know, your neshama comes up there, it has like a broken part to it, a broken this, a broken that. So Gehenim is like the physiotherapy, the spiritual physiotherapy. And the truth is, it does hurt. But you get past the hurt, you keep going through the process and what happens at the end. So what happened at the end, Barb? You feel good. It's like step by step and then you feel rejuvenated. Yes. Yeah, and then you feel good and you're back to the your whole self. So this concept of Olam Haba is like a spiritual tight connection with Hashem. And that's the way that we should be looking at it. You don't want to be... Like there's like lower levels of why you do what you do. The lowest level is, yeah, I want to get to all of my book because I just want reward. So it's not that you want reward. You want what the reward is. And that is this closeness to Hashem. Like we want to feel this like euphoric, like oneness with Hashem. Like we say, like Hashem is like he breathed the neshama into you. So there's a little part of Hashem inside of us. And we want to feel that close 
connection to it. Do you know what I mean? So it's a it's a very beautiful idea. And and the way you're looking at it as that you're looking at it as that's what I want, the connection to Hashem. So therefore, going through Gehenim, you'd be okay with it because that's what you wanted. You don't want to, you're gonna get there and you're gonna feel, ugh, my leg is broken, or ugh, I'm so soiled. Like you're gonna be like, thank you for cleaning me up. Because what I really want in the end is to be able to stick to you without anything in between. So now here are some examples of what Gehenim is. So they say a lot of times that like, people talk about it as fire. It's not going to be a real fire, okay? Because you're not in a physical body. It's not like fire would bother you. But it's almost like an emotional, cognitive understanding. So what's the emotional, cognitive understanding that you are going to feel? So one, they say, you will feel the pain that you caused other people. So what's interesting, they say that we don't really always feel the pain completely. Like, you know, you said something not so nice to someone, you know, that could hurt, but you have a lot of excuses. It's like, well, they deserved it. What's the big deal? You know what I mean? You know, I didn't do anything so terrible. But when you get to Olam Haba, it's 100% clarity, 100% truth. So suddenly you're going to realize the bottom line was I really, really hurt that person. And there really is no excuse. It's an interesting idea. So that's going to be like a certain kind of remorse, like a certain kind of pain that you're going to feel because you won't be able to change the circumstance. So that's hard. Like that's a hard feeling. Like it's like, oh my gosh, like look what I did. You know what I mean? And I was trying to fool myself that what I did was really the right thing, but really it was my own selfishness, right? So that's an interesting idea. Then they said like, they'll show you like, there will be this idea of the movie of your life. And then there will be the idea of what you could have been. And that's going to be very hard. Like, that's also hard. Like, oh my gosh, I mean, I could have done this and I could have done that. And I could have, could have, would have, should have. And at the end, I didn't. Now I don't really have the opportunity to go back and really change it. So it's just like, a, like there's going to be, I guess, the feeling of regret. There's going to be some regret and remorse. You know what I mean? And those are like, they're hard feelings. Like they, they actually do feel like, you know, when you feel shame, you also feel almost like there's a fire inside of you. Do you know what I mean? Like something is burning and you want to escape. That's as so I can imagine how, you know, this could feel. Okay. So that's this concept of the Gehenim part. And they also say it's very interesting. Like they say, what is Gehenim? So it's, they use this as the mushal. Okay. So they say Gehenim will be the same circumstance. It's very interesting. It'll be like the wicked person is sitting on one side of the table and another wicked person is sitting on another, on the other side of the table. And no one can bend their hands. They can't use their elbows. And they have this like fork right? So they're all sitting there starving because their arms are like this and they can't seem to get the fork into their mouth. But the tzaddik side has the same story. The tzaddikim also, they won't be able to bend their elbows. But what they're going to do is they're going to take food, they're going to spear it, put it on the fork and feed it to the person in front of them. Do you see the difference? In other words, the rasha will always say so narcissistic. He'll be stuck in his own self. He won't be able to get beyond, you know, I don't want to be here. I hate this. Bah, 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 right. And he'll let himself starve and let the person across from him starve because he can't even think beyond himself. But the tzaddik, he'll be fine. He'll feed his friend. His friend will feed him. You know, <laughs> it'll all be good. So it's just an analogy. It's not like what will really happen, but it's an analogy. Right. So if you were a person who could you problem solved, you didn't feel only the world was about you, you were able to look, you know what I mean, and see a bigger picture, then Olam Haba will be a pleasure for you. Right. It'll be fine. It'll be wonderful. We were the reward for this incredible soul that you had. But if you were a narcissist, Olam Haba will be Gehenim. Do you know what I mean? Like you'll 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 starve because it, you know what I mean? You won't be able to feed yourself and all your lusts and all your wants. So it's just another idea. Okay. And he said, no physicality, no body, no drink, no food, no that, and and no like you know anything except sitting with Hashem and learning. Okay, you're just uniting. And the only reason why the Rambam, remember, many of the other rabbis do call Olam Haba the end of history, right? They don't call it. 
the same as the world of souls. This Rambam is saying it's only the world of souls. It's called Olam Haba, the world to come, even though it exists right now. Like as we exist here, our parents, many of us, our parents have passed on. They're in Olam in the Olam HaEmes, Olam HaNishamos, right? So how does the Rambam call it Olam Haba, the world to come? So he says, how is it called the world to come? Because it will come when you get to it, okay? Even though it exists now, you're not going there until 120, right? Until you pass on. So that's how he, he um, understands why it's still called Olam Haba. We personally, the majority of us, we call the world after we die, Olam Hanishamos, the world of the souls. And we call the end of history, Olam Haba. Okay, so we have like, it's just a different terminology, same name, but different understanding. Okay, so I just want to make sure that we got that idea. So we will not be able to do any mitzvahs. We won't be able to do anything in Olam Haba. You can't like change your situation. The only way you could change it is if you left mitzvahs that continue themselves. You know, somebody built a building, you gave money, you gave charity for a, a school, and that school is still around. Like, you know what I mean? And it, it keeps, right? It keeps uh, what's earning interest, right? But you won't be able to. So, sorry, Barb, you have to unmute, unmute. Oh, I am now. Can you hear me? Okay. I had a lady, um, what was her name? I um, her, her daughter was Devorah Shmalavis and the mother of her, her yeah, mother. Phyllis Weinberg. Phyllis, Phyllis Weinberg. Weinberg did the, I still get phone calls to keep my hour for no loss and horror. Yes. Hour. Right. So that's perfect. She, so that's she, a perfect example. Yeah. She passed on, but what she left behind, the seed keeps blooming. That's a perfect example. Okay. Now, it's very interesting. So some people, they talk about reincarnation, right? Like we have this idea that if the soul didn't finish its job, it can go down and be reincarnated. The Rambam tells us that the soul would rather get hen in than be reincarnated. Like people get this like impression like, oh, no, I don't finish the job. I'll just come back and be reincarnated. It says reincarnation is extremely painful. Okay. You don't want to be reincarnated. You sometimes don't know why you're reincarnated. You know where you're going to be sent. It's not like something the souls are like, yay, you know, send me to be reincarnated. They say, no, better to go to Gehenna than to be reincarnated. Okay. So it's just important for us because we kind of throw it around like as if it was nothing. So it's interesting, you know, um, Sarah Yecheved Rigler, I don't know if people know who she is, but she was a speaker. She speaks Fresh Torah. She's a writer. She just wrote a book all about reincarnation. She feels that although her, she was her parents, her boobies, no, Nobody was in the Holocaust. She feels like she's a soul that was in the Holocaust. She had crazy connections to the German language, crazy dreams, crazy this. And she actually did a book on all these different interviews with people, even non-Jews, non-Jews who feel that they were reincarnation. They had all these recalls and memories of, you know, a life in, during the Holocaust. So it's just an interesting idea. That is just um, like a possibility, right? But it's not something like you would dwell on. It's not something you want to say. It's not something you want to think about. It's not something, you know what I mean? It's just, it's, it's part of our Jewish understanding, but we don't have a 100% clear picture on it, right? And we don't, we wouldn't look at it as like, I don't have to do my mission. I don't have to finish my job because you know what? I'll just come back again. Like it's, it's not the way we would um, lead our lives. Okay. Okay. Now let me see what else here. So it says, okay, so sometimes where you can see, like sometimes where the rabbis will tell you where you would see a reincarnation if a child dies and they die before their bar mitzvah. So sometimes they'll say that that was a reincarnation. It was a, that it was like a, that soul had a little mission. It was a small mission, whatever it was, it accomplished its mission, right? And it had to go home. So that's what they will say often when it comes to those kinds of situations. Mm -hmm. Is that is that what they call a Gilgul? Yes, excellent. That's exactly what they call a Gilgul. Very, 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 very good. Okay, now we do know, like when it comes to this idea of getting into the world to come, that we do believe as Jews, when things happen to us that are not great, that what you want to do is right away say, 
It should be a kapara. This should be a forgiveness for me. I, I may have done something wrong, Hashem. I don't know exactly what it is. But if this is a punishment and this is something that, you know, I've got to work with, I'm grateful and it should just be a, an atonement for me. So we don't believe like, you know, frustration and these kind of things is just an accident, too bad, or, you know, you're a loser, whatever the case may be. We really believe every one of those things have a purpose. So you would say like, Hashem, you're not just doing this for no reason. Let it be a kapara. Let me grow from it. Give me the, you know, help me understand how to accept it. All these different um understandings of Amuna and Bitachon, they apply to this kind of idea again. Do you know what I mean? So it keeps, okay, good. Now, now comes, that's, that's his, I, that's the Rambam's view on what we call Olam Haba. Now we're going to look at his view on Shiach himself. Okay. <coughs> so just Shiach is a very general term. So it's just good for us to know because you'll see it a lot of times and they'll call him the Mashiach and blah, 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 you know, in, in the Torah, in Tanakh. So what does Mashiach means? Anointed. They even call the Kohen Gadol the Mashiach because he's anointed with oil. Mashiach means to anoint. Okay. So anoint a leader. So when we're talking about Yimei HaMashiach, we're talking about the days of the ultimate Mashiach. So there's an ultimate Jewish leader who is going to redeem the Jewish people. Now I'm going to talk to you about the way it looks from the Ramban. Okay. So he says, who would this Mashiach be? Like, who is this Mashiach going to be? So here are some of the attributes of the Mashiach. One, he's a person. Okay. So that's number one. He's not a, you know, a, a crazy, spiritual, ghosty thing. He is a person like all of us, okay? So Baruch Hashem, you know, two eyes, a nose, a brain, like just a person who is born from Paris, okay? So it's not somebody who just pops up. It's not an immaculate conception. This is a normal person, okay? This normal person is a descendant. He can trace back his lineage right? Until David HaMelech. Okay, so he's part of the dynasty of David HaMelech. There are people who can do that. The Baal Shem Tov was part of the dynasty of David HaMelech. Okay, so it's important. He would be very righteous. What does righteous mean? Like God-fearing. God yes. Fearing. Okay, Learn. God fearing, he's not going to come and tell the Jewish people to do something that now you don't have to keep Shabbos anymore. He says a line like that, you know, he's out. Okay, like anyone who tries to, you know, turn anything that the Torah says, right, and says, no, you don't have to do this anymore. Instead, we have to do this. We know he's wrong. Okay, he's a prophet, nearly as great as Moshe. He will gather the ex exiles in, okay? he will bring all the Jewish people back to Israel. He will rebuild the temple and he will become the renowned spiritual leader of the world. So very funny because the Torah makes a lot of um, the Torah, the Medrash, the Chazal. They're always talking about the, like this uniting, like as if there's like this nation, the nation of the world. So the nation of the world that we're always talking about is the rabbis believe that it will be through like this United Nations. It will be able to get, if you look right now, like the United Nations, when they have to vote for Israel or anything Jewish, like we barely make it, right? They, they condemn us probably 24 seven, right? So what will happen is like, it's a turnaround, right? This United Nations will recognize this Mashiach as the spiritual leader of the world. And it will bring, what else will he do? It will bring an incredible peace, okay, because of it. But now listen to this, which was a very important idea, okay? It will be a wonderful time, but it will be a normal life, okay? So people will still go to work, right? And people will have to, will do mitzvahs and you will keep Shabbos and you will keep Yantif. This is the Yimei HaMashiach. And people will even still die. That's interesting. So you're not going to live forever. People will still die. You'll be like, you know, the, the world will be very blessed. So hopefully um, with the world's blessings, you know, it will be a more comfortable life and you, you know, maybe longer life. Yeah, hi. Okay. <laughs> We'll have a longer life, but it will still be a very real world. 
you know, like sometimes you kind of think, oh, Mashiach will come and then I won't have to go to school and I won't have to go to work and everything will be great. But it's not like that. According to the Rambam, it will be a normal existence, okay? A normal existence, which I think is, you know, I don't know if everybody uh, looked at it that way. He said it will be a normal existence. The greatest blessing of this normal existence will be that we will understand this connection to Hashem and we won't want to leave. It's not like we're going to betray him again and he will not like, like leave us again. So that's a very comforting and beautiful idea. Okay. So the rabbis ask if this is the case, because they say like, what's going to happen to the Yitzhahara? What does anybody know what's going to happen to the Yitzhahara in the days of Mashiach? Anybody want to unmute and tell me what's going to happen to the Yitzhahara in the days of Mashiach? It's all going to become good. Yeah. Gonna so the Yitzhar, they say, will be removed, will be removed. The Yitzhar will be removed. So the question is, so if the Yitzhar is going to be removed, we're all going to be good. So like, what do we need this all for? Like, it's just, it's just like a funny reality. So that just should be the end of the story. But the Torah, like according to the Rambam, that he's saying that the Yitzhar will be removed. It'll be primarily very, very good. But you will still have the actions of doing the mitzvahs. And it's as if Hashem is saying, you know what, I want to give you guys the greatest trip in Olam HaNeshamos, the greatest trip in the next world. Like, in other words, again, we will, people will die during the times of Mashiach. It's not that, you know, disease and everything is over, according to the Rambam. He said, it's not going to be like that. Will you be healthier? Yes. You know, you will live longer because what there's less stress, there's less turmoil, there's no more war. That helps a lot for people having a longer life. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. But he says people will still die, right? In fact, right, we know that the Mashiach himself will die. Like it's an interesting story here. Like it's a very different picture than what a lot of us felt. Like a lot of us said, okay, now we're going to live forever, blah, blah. That's not what he's saying. He does not say that. He doesn't say like that's the end of the destiny of history and now everything changes. It changes in that there's peace. You know what it really is? I'm going to be honest. You know what this is really? It's very similar to the time uh, when the Jewish people had the temple right at the beginning. You know, when Shlomo Melech was the king and everything felt you know, there was much more clarity, there was understanding, the world looked at Jerusalem as the eye of the world and where all knowledge came from. Like, do you see what I'm saying? It sounds like it, 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 it seems to me from what the Rambam is saying, it's more along those lines, all right? Okay. okay. Well, people yeah. be able to turn around, those that are you know, haven't believed or are shy. Yeah, it's interesting how he wrote. I'm so glad you asked that question, Lior. It's interesting. I was listening to Rabbi Berkowitz. He kind of said, like, for some people, it will be tough. Like, they will come around, but it won't be that easy for them to embrace right away. Because let's say Israel, if it's it's led by you know, David HaMelech, then it becomes a state where, you know, you have to be Shomer Shabbos. You know what I'm saying? It's a very different reality. So he was saying, like, for people... You know, for those of you who were on this team, it, it's a lot easier. The transition is what you wanted. You know what I mean? Like he actually was saying that it won't be easy to get the Jews to move to Israel, just like it wasn't by the second temple. You know, when they rebuilt the second temple, the majority of Jews stayed in Babylonia. They didn't want to go. <laughs> they said like, you know, we'll visit, but we have a very nice house right here. Do you know what I mean? It's an interesting idea. So it sounds like what he was saying is like, it's going to, like the Mashiach is going to have to drag us you know what I mean like some people are not going to be going so willingly some are like yeah, I don't care. you know my house can stay I don't care we're going you know because you could understand like I know it's going to sound so funny but if you think about it if there's a mass exodus let's say you know in Thornhill all of us want to go to Israel that's it so what's going to happen we're all going to put up our houses at the same time what's going to happen to the market I know it sounds funny right what would happen if there's 10 houses on the on the street trying to sell, but you could find these things in Detroit, like, you know, because the economies are so bad in certain states. So it's even, it's right, 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 it'll be much cheaper. You know what I mean? So 
So for you to want to leave to go to Israel, you're going to have to say, I'm going to take a hit. I don't care. I just, you know, I, I'm going to live this beautiful life with Hashem. I'm getting out of here. I'm going to the city where I can be the most, the best person. And that's where Mashiach says we have to be. And that's where Hashem wants us. I'm going. But you, but Rabbi Berkowitz was saying, like the Rambam was saying, there's going to be people who are going to go, I don't really want to go. Like they're not going to want to go so quickly, right? And he's going to have to keep it for What's happening now in Israel? Barb, you have a little louder, oh. sorry. Oh, with this new government in Israel, isn't it like I had a client, a Jewish client, and she's like, oh my God, I can't believe there's this, these Jewish religious are going to be in power. She's Jewish. Yeah. And, and right. Everything's going to be religious and you won't be able to catch a cab on Shabbos and the gays yeah. won't be able to. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that happening now? Like, yeah, 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 yeah. So a lot of the signs are Okay, so this is like, that's why it's really important to yeah. learn all this. Because you're pointing out some real realities. And I want to talk about this too, because, you know, we're right now, we're, we're all doing a lot of Mashiach talk. Like Mashiach is like a big, you know, he's a real conversation piece today. He really is. And in Eretz Yisrael, especially, like in Eretz Yisrael, they're really every minute, oh, is Mashiach this, the Mashiach that, Mashiach this. So I want to talk to you about it, like, because the Rambam has a certain perspective on all this that we have to kind of be, um, what's the word? We have to be very cautious and careful. Like he isn't into, he, in fact, he says really people should not spend their time looking at current events and trying to match it up with Mashiach coming this minute. So why do you think he says that? Why do you think he says that? Because we're right okay so one what Lior said he it, it, if he doesn't come it just gets people more and more down more and more frustrated more and more this so he said if people are sitting in and learning all these, these things and it's making us closer to Hashem that's phenomenal but he said it doesn't it ends up just spinning in our heads. And then we start trying to guess, well, this means this and this means that and this said this and this said that. And it, it, it can be a dangerous distraction because, right? Because remember, the Yitzhahar is still alive right now. He'd be very happy to get us distracted because in the end, when you're going to listen to what the Rambam has to say and any of the greats, all the rabbis, no matter if there's like these slight variances, right, in their understanding of Mashiach. Why is there those slight variances? Because there's different possibilities. He could come, yes, with a lot of pain and suffering. He could, like, you know, it could, like, because no matter what he's coming, ready or not, here he comes, right? So he could come through a lot of pain and suffering, or he could, or maybe we've had the pain and suffering. And if we just stay focused, we do tshuva, we try to be the best Jews that we can, we work on our muna, we work on our bitachon, then he may come without this of destruction, right? So therefore, like he's saying, the, these are the, the possibilities. What will happen will be based on us. I mean, how the story plays out, you know, it's kind of funny, but they have these library books for kids, right, where you read it, and then they have different endings, do you know what I mean, like, read to this, and it says, turn to page whatever, and then the author writes a different ending, then turn to page this, and then it talks about a different way the story could have ended, like, you could end up getting married, you could end up, like, breaking up, you could end up, you know what I mean, all of these different scenarios so there's all going to be different why because it's all going to depend on the choices that we make so the rambam says one thing you know the best choice you can make stay focused okay stay focused on why you're here and that will bring mashiach the best way mashiach can come if we like spend all day long going he should have done this and now that ukraine is here and this is like that and, and start all panicking and getting all hyper hyper then it's not going to help anybody and it's not going to move us towards the end so he really doesn't recommend like he's like in other words he says here's the possibilities now that you know those possibilities know what to do right chuva closeness to hashem stay focus you know what i mean move your neshama muscles okay that's what he's telling us to do. Okay, so let me just see one more thing that I want to say. Yeah, so that was a good question. That's what they said. Okay, so now this issue, the issue is like this. Every generation, every generation has a possible Mashiach alive in it. 
all right, in every generation, because we say in every generation, Mashiach could come. If any generation Mashiach could come, we have to appreciate the person would have to be born from normal parents. He would have to be a righteous person. Like he would have to, to have these realities. You can only have these realities if you're living, you're an alive person in the generation. So sometimes people like felt the Chafetz Chaim could be Mashiach in the time of Chafetz Chaim, right? They said Moshe was really supposed to be Mashiach in the time of Moshe. The Jewish people would not have made a big boo-boo and all the mistakes they made with the spies and all this stuff that Moshe would have led the Jewish people into Israel and that would have been the end of the story. So, you know, some some, uh, some Hasidim believe that Breslov Rebbe, you know, Rav Nachman was Mashiach. Like, there's so many, Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Akiva, right? They said that the temple was destroyed and then like 35 years later, there was this, um, uh, Bar Kokhba was a general, okay? And Rabbi Akiva thought he was Mashiach. Told everybody, this guy's Mashiach, he's going to get, because he was fighting against the Romans, he was winning, we're going to get the temple back. He's a, like the whole nine yards. Okay, they had this huge victorious battle, only to lose later, terribly. And he died, and they say, like, he died for the sins. So the question was, like, who sinned? His sins? It could be his sins. It could be also the people's sins. But he, it got to his head, this whole business of him being the Mashiach and him being the greatest general. He started saying, like, don't worry about it. I'll win the war, like, without that Emir Shem part. You know what I mean? Like, just, oh, I'm going to do it, right? And then what happened? Akiva saw. He died. And then Rabbi Akiva, like, oh, my gosh. It's not the Mashiach. So the Rambam's Shita is that every generation, there is a person who is born who could be the Mashiach, who has the strength, the spiritual strength and stamina to save the Jewish people. But if he does not accomplish his mission, and that could be for many reasons, maybe, you know, we don't recognize him, maybe this, maybe it's not the right time, whatever it is, according to the Rambam, once he dies, he will not resurrect or come back again. We do not believe in this concept of a second coming, right? Like in the Christian world, they believe that Yashka, like, right? He died on the cross and that he will come back. Okay? They're not saying someone else will come or the Jewish Messiah. No, they're saying Yashka himself who died will be resurrected. He will come back. So we, as the Jewish people, that is not the um, what would it, mainstream view. The mainstream view is if you died, then you died. I mean, and that's it. Because otherwise, there could be hundreds of these people coming back. Who's to say, you know, some people say this person, this person, but you know what? There's, then Moshe should come back. Abraham should come back. David Amel should come back. I'm trying to say, so really, the mainstream view is you had your opportunity, the generation had their opportunity. They didn't merit the coming of the Mashiach. So then, right? And I think that I forgot to say that was very important. Mashiach will fight spiritual war. It will, Mashiach will be the one who fights for Hashem and his glory. Like you could see, like I'm going to be real honest here, that you could see how people could believe that the Lubavitcher Rebbe was, had the incredible potential to be Mashiach. There's no question about it. He took his whole life and gave it to trying to fight Hashem's war, right? But, you know, other people too, maybe Rav Noach, maybe Rabbi Akiva, like so many people, but that's how you could see who they would be. They take their life and they don't just sit around and think about themselves. They're looking at this global, you know, world that it needs help and that we have to reach out to our brothers and our sisters and try to help people learn more about who they are as Jews. Do you know what I mean? But according to the Rambam, once the person passes on, the, the mantle of who will be Mashiach is the next living person in the next generation who has these potential qualities, okay? Right? Now, there's some opinions that may say different, but I'm saying the mainstream opinion is this opinion. Okay. So let me see. Okay. I'm, I just want to get to this other part, which was very good. Okay, so it's just an interesting idea that the Rambam, he had a famous um, 
uh, writings, which was like the disputations. Okay, so disputations is he had a huge debate. The Rambam is very interesting. The Rambam had a debate with a priest who originally was a Jew, okay, who converted to Christianity, became a very hush of priest, and they had this huge debate, it was famous, in Spain, all right, so it was like Christianity versus Judaism, right, so he kept quoting, like, this um, Jewish slash convert to Christianity, he kept quoting, like, all of the prophets, you know, Yechezkel and Daniel and, and all of these people who talk about the coming of Mashiach, and he kept trying to use it as the second coming, the second coming, you know, Yeshke's coming back. So the Rambam, like, really debated him to the point that he won the debate, okay, he won the debate, which was incredible, like, all the people in the audience voted that the Rambam won the debate. But it was a Christian country, and the, the king of Spain, he was insulted. So he said to the Rambam, he said, I never saw anybody articulate and debate so well a lie like you did. <laughs> and then he had to save his life because they wanted to kill him, all right, for defaming Christianity. So he exiled him from Spain, and the big bracha was that the Rambam went to Eretzisrael after that. So it's just like, it's just to show you like this Mashiach topic is very big and very controversial, right? And everybody in their religious domain, like the Islam and, and Christianity and Judaism, like we're, we're all rooting for our guy. You know what I mean? And then you see like even within, now look at this. Okay, so everybody's voting like, it's my, you know, it's Yashka. No, it's going to be this new Muhammad. No, it's going to be our, our Mashiach Ben David. You know, like everybody's voting. Then within Judaism itself, Right, you have the Breslovers are saying, no, it's Rav Nachman. Rav Nachman's going to come back. He's going to be Mashiach. And then you have Lubavitchers. No, Rav Nachman, Nachman Mendel's going to come. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, it's such a, what's the word? Passionate, heated topic. So what's the Rambam trying to say? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. What matters is you helping to bring Mashiach. Right? That's what really matters. It's what you will do, the kindness that you will do, the tefillah that you will do, the Torah learning that you will do. That's what really matters, okay? So very interesting, okay? Now, okay, so now, okay, so now we said this whole idea of the Olam Haba, we said Mashiach, and now we're just gonna talk a little bit of this concept of the resurrection of the dead. Okay, so now, here is very interesting. So the Rambam has a very different view, okay? So the Rambam feels just like Hashem, he split the sea. So when Hashem split the sea, and when he gave the Jewish people the Torah, he did it with this, ooh, like it was huge. The splitting of the sea was something completely unheard of. And they say that as the waters of the sea split in everybody's cup and in everybody's lake all over the world, whatever the size of the world was then, water split. It's just to like, that was the way to broadcast it, okay? We didn't have CNN and uh, Fox News. So they broadcasted, that's how Shem broadcasted it across the world. So it's something like really spectacular. So according to the Rambam, Tzriyas HaMesim will be the unification of the body and the soul. He does believe that there will be this resurrection and he stands alone on this point. No one else really backs the Rambam on this, okay? So Rambam stands on his own and he says some point after Mashiach, 10, 1,000, he, like, he doesn't know the number. He says that there will be this resurrection of the dead, but these people, it's very interesting, will only live another 70 years. Here's the Rambam's look. Okay, so I know this is hard for us to understand, but here's where the Rambam takes life from, which is different, I'm saying, than all the other rabbis. He kind of looks at it as a physical body can never last forever. So he really has this feeling like, to him, olam haba is olam hanishamos. Like the destiny of everything is at the end in a heavenly realm. Okay, in a heavenly realm where body does not live forever. He doesn't have this concept of body living forever. Many other rabbis say, no, Tchiyas HaMesim is people will be resurrected and we will live forever and you will be at peace in your body and you will have a body. And their view 
is more like the view of the original way Hashem created the world, where he said, when Adam and Chava, right, were in Gan Eden, right, in the Garden of Eden, he said, if you just behave yourself, <laughs> okay, and you don't eat from this tree, you will live forever in harmony. So it's just like different perspectives. Do you see what's going on here? So it's just two different kinds of perspectives, okay? So what does that mean? That they live, their body and soul will live for another 70 years. Yeah, that's what he feels. And then they're going to die. And then that's it. It's interesting. It's just an interesting idea. But then what happens after that? Okay, so then, so that's what I'm saying. In his perspective, it's just very interesting, Leora, like when you think about it, and that's why he calls Olam Haba, he calls Olam Haba, Olam HaNeshamos. In his view, the world to come is also just living with Hashem with no body. That's what his view is. That's it. Like, in other words, people would just continue. I don't think he believes that death would, would finish, right? Or if it does finish, it's just we will live in a plane of just spiritual beings. He doesn't believe. He said he doesn't see how you could be a spiritual being and have a physical body and last forever. Like, in his reality, the physical body decays. He's the only one who believes this. All the other rabbis, like it's all the Hasidim, the Mikubalim, the Rishonim, Rishonim, they all degree, disagree with him. And they believe that it will be a reunification of body and soul like in Gan Eden. And like it will be an upgraded spiritual bliss. And this will be the end. And that's what we, the, like the mainstream thought, it's just interesting to see the different perspectives. That's all. The mainstream thought is that will be Olam Haba body and soul together, peace on earth, complete understanding of Hashem, like just a blissful existence, like, like that you would have had, you know, with this concept of, um, sorry, with the concept of living in Gan Eden, where Hashem said, you're going to live forever. Hi, Sandy. So it's just like a very interesting idea. Okay. So just a, a very interesting idea. Okay. So let me just see. Okay, so now, like in this time of Moshiach, remember we said when Moshiach will come and he will take us back to Israel and this and that, there'll be a lot of obstacles, things that like stood in our way, frustrations, this and that. You'll just be able to deal better with life. You'll want to do mitzvahs. You'll want to be closer to Hashem. You're going to want to pump and flex your muscle. Okay, so that's a very nice idea. Okay, now... And what do we call? Mashiach will be a great time where Hashem will, and that's exactly what it was like when Shlomo Melech was here. It's, it's Shlomo Melech's time where Hashem says, I want to dwell on earth. It's you finally built me an apartment that I really love, the base of Mikdash, the final base of Mikdash, and here's where I want to live. Okay? Interesting. So now let's just talk about what we kept talking about, the time before Mashiach. So let's hear what what, what uh, the Rambam has to say about the time before Mashiach. So it's called Chevle Mashiach. What did we say Chevle Mashiach means? Birth pangs. Excellent. Okay, birth pangs. So what does birth pangs mean? Difficulty. <laughs> difficulty. Okay, it's like giving birth to something. How is it that people can go I mean, through the birth process? Coming yes, out. Yes. Giving birth to something new, a new reality, which it would be if there's peace on earth and everyone understands that there's Hashem. And we start to go to the, you know, Israel and we get the base of Mikdash and we have a righteous prophet. Yeah, it's this whole new world. Okay, right. And we're getting closer and everything. But why is it that people can go through birth? Because you know the end of the tunnel. Okay, this is what the rabbis are trying to tell us a lot. Like, yes, this can sound scary and spooky, but you know the end of the story. The end of the story is you're giving birth right, to this beautiful, wonderful baby. The end of the story is you're giving birth to the end of civilization and putting us in a much better place. So Yechezkel and Zachariah talk a lot. Remember, we talked about this idea with the war. And I really want to explain this because there's some uh, um, rabbis who will give us a different perspective that may be a little more comforting, okay? So when we talk about this war of Gog and Magog, what did we say? It wasn't Gog fighting Magog. Gog is the name of the king, and he may Gog, like he comes from Gog, from Magog. So it's very interesting because if you take a look of with the word Magog, it, it's similar to the word Armageddon. Okay, so the way we say Gogu Magog, 
the Christian world says Armageddon. Now they're very fixated on this, right? This is like where I was telling you, the Rambam says like, don't put all these, you know, current events and try to connect it all because then you're going to start thinking, this thing like you know you can cause an incredible panic right and then you don't see mashiach and then you panic even more so he says like the christians are very into this armageddon they're always looking you know for current events and trying to lock the two things together and this is it we're at the end of the final stage and it's all going to be crazy so we're going to just have to like calm down because as crazy as it would ever be you know one thing it's all going to be hashem okay it's all going to be hashem Okay, so who is Gogu Magog? There's a couple hints in the Torah. So it says, very interesting, it's the northern kingdoms. Okay, so who is this northern kingdom? So some people say it's Russia. The Vilna Gon actually said, well, this is hundreds of years ago, get ready if you see the Russians move into eastern Ukraine. He said, get ready for Mashiach if you see the Russians move into eastern Ukraine. Okay. Okay, let me see, but that's still is mysterious. Like we still, you know, I, I can't point anything. And then the Vilna Gon said, there will be a major war, but it won't last more than 12 minutes. Okay, so how would he, you know, this is crazy that he would even say these things. Okay, this is like, you know, hundreds of years ago. He's just very interesting how he understood these ideas and said these things. Okay, now what we're saying, yes, and it's very interesting. Now, here comes the Rambam, who has a very different view. Okay, so the rabbis, we said there's always this leader who's going to come and help the Jewish people and organize us. And, and you know, because he, he said that, that, let's say the UN, the UN will come and they will be very anti-Israel. That's what they're saying. They, all the world, this Gog will unite the nations to be very anti-Israel. They're going to want to march on to march on Israel. So we're saying we have this concept that there's a Mashiach ben David who is going to fight for the Jewish people. The Rambam is very interesting. Now listen how different he is. He says there is no such thing, uh, not Mashiach ben David, Mashiach ben Yosef. He said there is no such thing as Mashiach ben Yosef. There's only this one Mashiach ben David. It's just, again, these are his interpretations. Now to say they're his interpretations, it means from his understanding, what Hashem gave him as an understanding, this is what he's saying. So what's he really saying? There's going to be different possibilities. That's what really it ball, 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 boils down to. There will be different possibilities, and those possibilities will reflect where we are in history. You see what I'm saying? If we're at a certain level, and we have a certain bitachon, and we've done tshuva, and we're closer to Hashem, then things will move in a much gentler process. If we're not, then you might need a little more washing in the washing machine. Do you see what I'm saying? And things may be in a different process. So it's just important for us to know that. Like if you have to, like the Torah says, there's 70 faces to the Torah. What does that mean, 70 faces to the Torah? 70 different possibilities of how things can play out, right? But they will play out always Mida Kenegan Mida, always according to who we are, where we are, what we're doing. Okay, that's how they're going to play out. And all of us are like that. That's that's normal in our lives. There's many possibilities of something that you're going to do. It'll play out as to where you are, right? Right? You're ready to get a new job. You lost your job. You're this, like things in your life are going to move around, right? And you're going to act accordingly and it's going to play out, right? Accordingly. Okay, now, so let's see here. Okay, so let me just see again. Okay, so Rambam says there is no Mashiach ben David and says that before Mashiach comes, there will be a lot of issue. Okay, a lot. There will be starvation and all kinds of sad things. He, he does not say, he does not make it sound like it'll be a birth pang. You'll have to really hold on to your Muna. It will not be an easy time. Okay. But he says, he recommends, do not spend time speculating about these things. Instead, concentrate on loving Hashem and being close to him. Because by speculating on this stuff, you can get depressed. You will not be a better Jew necessarily, and you could lose your faith. So he says, like, you know, stay out of that line of thought, okay? Okay, and he says, like, we have to understand one thing, right? The only way to short circuit the process, the only way to make it happen faster is prayer, Torah and good deeds. Those are the three things that will bring Mashiach closer and 
you know, and short circuit any of the negativity that is supposed to come. Okay. So now, that's a nice idea. So if you look at the beginning, Medrash Rabbah tells you, like, it's interesting why it says, Bereshith bara Elohim, in the beginning, Hashem created the world. And right away, it sort of talks about how the world is very, like, dark and blank. And it's very interesting. So it says, like, the world is empty and it was very confused and there was great darkness. And Hashem, the spirit of Hashem, you know, hovers over the depths. So the Medrash tells you that this refers to the exiles of the Jewish people. It makes so much sense, like when you think about it, right? Because in Hashem's eyes, like history is in a blink. It's like whatever you, you know what I mean? Like he's, he's, there's no time, right? He's boundless. Like, like you're experiencing the past, the present, and the future all at one time. So it says like this, when you look at the world as being empty, that was the um, exile of Babel, right? Because Nebuchadnezzar comes and he destroys the first base of Mikdash, like, and then the world feels empty because what did we say? Hashem was dwelling among us. You would go to the base of Mikdash, you could see all these beautiful Nisim every single day. You really felt God's presence, right? He's dwelling among you and now he, the world becomes en empty. Confused. Now listen, per, the Bavel, we were in exile for 70 years. Then Persia comes, that's Haman, and he wants to kill all the Jewish people. It was a very confusing time for the Jews. Like, what? Like, here we are. We're good citizens. We're loyal. We're doing everything you want. Like, what do you mean? You want to come and tell us? Like, it's a confusing time, 52 years. Then darkness. So Greece, like, that's the whole idea of the story of, you know, of Hanukkah, right? Because then we, you know, we light the menorah. We bring light because they brought darkness. They told us we couldn't learn Torah. Instead of giving you the clarity of real truth that we're giving the clarity of garbage which was dark and that was 150 years and then Hashem spirit hovers over the depths of the seas the depths of the seas is the exile that we've been in for over 2,000 years more almost right for all these thousands of years that we've been sitting in this exile like it's an 3,300 years that we've been in it so you know, the depths, like it's very, anybody ever seen a blue hole? Anybody ever, like if you ever go to these oceans, there's these things called a blue hole or even in like, and it just goes down. They can't even go down far enough, right? Because your ears would pop, you wouldn't, you can't live to do it. You can't dive that far down, you know, into a blue hole. It's just interesting. So that's kind of what this sort of feels like. And so this last Gullus is called the Roman Gullus. It's Edom, okay? Right? And it's it's Asav's. It's Asav's Gullus, okay? Now, it's all over the world. Christianity is the biggest force in the world until the very, very end of history, right? And then it's going to turn. And that's what you're seeing right now. Where Christianity right now is, it's racing in terms of followers with with the Muslims, right? The Muslims are actually gaining right on the Christians. More people are not following Christianity. People are finding it very hard to keep their children, right, linked into their chain, right? That's the truth, except for Islam, okay? It's growing by leaps and bounds, okay? unfortunately. Okay, so, so um, this Roman, like it's interesting, even our alphabet is from, Rome. Most of our civil laws are from Rome. Like Western civilization is very based on the Roman Empire. It doesn't even exist anymore, but we keep calling it Edom because it's the last one. Now, Daniel had a vision. This is a vision. In his vision, he saw this like very unusual statue. And the parts of the statue, they say, also represent the Gullises. So he saw a statue of gold that was its head, right? And then he saw silver and arms of copper and legs of iron, right? And they also presented the different goluses. So the gold was Bavel, the um, silver was Persia, the arms was of copper was Yavon, and the legs were iron. And like we've been, he's been held up on those legs for a very, very long time. So now that Torah tells you that in the end, like you know, his legs, there's going to be feet. Okay. So at the very end of this statue, they say is Yishmal. Okay, is the Arabs which they are taking over, like as we're slowly watching like Europe and everywhere else and, you know, and, and you see in Israel nonstop, nonstop. So the Torah tells you, it's very interesting. 
the rest of those people, like the Bavel and these people and that people, they had very few merits. Do you know that? They don't have a lot of spiritual merit. They have a lot of physical strength. They come after the Jew to wake him up and remind him who he is and, you know, like, don't assimilate because if you assimilate we're going to hate you anyway <laughs> okay so you better remember who you are that's what he is he's like a mighty he's a mighty force he's like a he's the stick you know what i mean who comes to hit us but yishmal the Torah tells you is a much scarier adversary so why a much scarier adversary because in his name and in israel is Hashem. so they have a couple spiritual merits and they come to fight, supposedly, for very spiritual causes, right? And they have, like, they do a bris, and they have um, sneas, like, the, you know, you don't see that women walk around the way we see Roman women walking around, you know what I mean? Like, they have some spiritual they, merits. And they're from, say that again, sorry, Sandy? They have, saying? oh, no, they're, they're, um, they're kashrut. Yes. Like they have, and bris, they have a lot of stuff. You know what I mean? That's very, very interesting. So the Torah tells you like to fight them, the Jewish people have to have more spiritual merits. Okay. So now this is a different kind of fight. Like when you're fighting against someone physically, who cares? How you dime your day Esau and Yaakov always wins with his, you know, kol kol Yaakov, right? Torah, <laughs> chesed, and the what's it called and prayer. So it makes sense. But here, this is a little bit harder. Do you know what I mean? It's a little bit harder because we have to have merits. Okay. So that's a, a, a like something that we should be thinking about. You know, like we got to up our game. That's all. They, they're very, you know, they're ready to up their game. We have to get ready to up our game. So it's just an interesting idea okay so it's a little bit harder in the end it says which is very interesting that the torah says um in the end yishmo will collaborate with paras which is modern day persia which is iran yishmo will collaborate with iran you know what that will mean that iran is going to fund all the terrorist activity I mean, that's what's going to happen. And that makes sense. And that's what Iran would want to do, right? And Iran would want all these air. This makes sense. I don't think this is any great, like, I mean, the the, the incredible part is that the this is, you know, told over hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago. Yeah, that's the incredible part. But for us to see this idea that Yishmo would join with Persia, it makes a lot of sense. Okay. Okay. So all these things happening. So let's say we're seeing right now in history, a lot of this stuff that seems to line up, like Russia's getting close to Ukraine, a 12 minute war. Yeah, that could make sense. Uh, Yishmo is joining forces with Persia. The world and anti-Semitism is like, oh, like I keep saying, right? Everybody else needs help. You know, the, the Muslims, the blacks, the this, the that, but the Jew, you can beat up in the street. Nobody says boo. Okay. Right. No big deal for us. Like that's that we don't count. Okay. You know, so like there's always, right. Like a, 10, 10 million double standards. So you're seeing a lot of these like so-called signs, right? So-called signs and right. And we see it. And you also see like what they say, so much chutzpah and all this kind of stuff. So we see it. So Hashem is saying, okay, now see it. You can't necessarily connect all the dots, but the dots are there. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like they're there and you should take it seriously, right? If you see these people coming at you and they're like excited and they're like they're so pumped to do all this then we have to be so pumped to do the right that's probably really hard for us okay it just is all right so now what's the good news and the good news is what we always said i'm so happy i finally heard somebody it. i'm so happy so at the end of the torah it says that avram took a wife and her name was Ketura. who was Ketura? does anybody know it was hagar how did why did he take her she did tshuva and they, they called her Ketura, like the name Ketores. She had a very good smell. So remember when we talk about Lulav and Esrog and all this, and we say, some have a good taste and some have a good smell. So we said, taste is Torah, right? You have to taste the sweetness of the Torah, use your mouth. And smell, Reach Nechoach, is your good deeds. You know, instead of smelling like a rat, you smell like a rose, which means you're, you know what I mean? What you've done is you're a good person, right? So in the end, like he said, this will be the greatest bracha. If An Yishmol himself does tshuva, right? He goes back to Abraham. He treats it with dignity. He lets Yitzchak walk in front of him at the funeral. So 
this could be a good thing, okay? Because suddenly we will have millions of cousins that we didn't know. <laughs> You know, mishpacha that was far apart will finally come together. So there's like some really, you know, beautiful realities here. So yes, you know, it's interesting to hear the different um, opinions, right? And it's interesting to hear what the Rambam has to say and how he stands alone on some ideas and how he's part of the mainstream on some ideas. But the good part of this story is it is all good in the end. And if we want to make the end better, then we got to get in on the program and we have to fight for Hashem and his glory, right? And Emirates Hashem, you know, it'll all be good. It'll come soon. It'll come swift. And there are people, which I wanted to also say one last thing, is there are people who say that this terrible war, that is starvation and destruction has already happened. And there are people who will tell you that they feel that the Holocaust was that Milchemes Gog Magog. And the truth is, if you think Hitler did try to march on to Israel and on, he did, he was going to go to, he was over Israel, right? Like, what's his name? The desert rat or whatever they were, right? And he was actually joining forces with the Muftas and all this kind of stuff, right? Yes. So, yeah. So there are some people who, who say that, you know what I mean? Like most of that horribleness was already, already happened. But on the other hand, we don't know. And our job is to just move forward. Okay, so I think we have to say that thank you prayer, but I'm so sad because Amita is not here. Does anybody have a thank you prayer that they could say? Sandy, do you have? Okay, I have one. Bob, Does anybody Barbara have does. the thank you prayer? Bob, do you want to say? No, Bob, Barbara does. Uh, do you want to say Barb? We're going to let you say oh, it. The my, my biggest <laughs> fan is, uh, is Mrs. Jeff. <laughs> thank you Sarah, for reminding me. Of course. Okay. Thank oh, you for I... reminding me. Oh, well, I, I put it in my okay. Okay. We'll give you time. Okay, so I can stop I the recording. Hello. Uh,